Ted Bundy is one of the most infamous serial killers to date. It is fair to say there aren't too many other serial killers that can compare to how twisted he was and the details of his murders can send chills up anyone's spine. Other than his purely evil and manipulative nature, many believe Bundy was one of the nicest people they had ever met. He enrolled in law school and worked for a suicide prevention hotline. In fact, when the details started to emerge about his murders, people became shocked. Many who knew him said they never imagined he would be capable of such crimes. No one really knows who Ted Bundy's father is. The name of his father listed on his birth certificate is Lloyd Marshall, an Air Force veteran. However, later in Bundy's life, his mother, Eleanor Louise Cowell, stated that his birth father was a sailor by the name of Jack Worthington. However, many people feel that Cowell wasn't honest about who Bundy's father was because she wanted to hide one of the darkest secrets of her life, that her father, Samuel Cowell, raped and impregnated her. No evidence proves that Samuel Cowell fathered his grandson. In 1965, Ted Bundy graduated from high school and went off to college. He first went to the University of Puget Sound, also known as UPS. The future killer stayed at UPS for about a year before he transferred to the University of Washington, where he began to study in an intensive Chinese language program in 1966. It was around this time he met a young lady, whom we know by many pseudonyms from Bundy's biographies, but she is most commonly called Stephanie Brooks. In 1968, Bundy dropped out of the University of Washington and started working minimum wage jobs. Around this time, Brooks ended their relationship, citing Bundy's immaturity. Ted Bundy came into this world on November 24th, 1946. His mother gave birth to him at the Elizabeth Lund home for unwed mothers. From there, he went to go live with his maternal grandparents in Philadelphia. His grandparents raised him like he was their son and his birth mother was his older sister. The reason behind this was the family didn't want to deal with any social stigma. Some people believe Bundy found out the truth when a cousin showed him his birth certificate. Others say he found out himself around 1969 when he found his birth certificate. During and for a while after his college days, Ted Bundy dated a woman who many know as Stephanie Brooks. Today, we know Stephanie's real name is Diane Edwards and that the couple was indeed in love, at least for a period. The couple became briefly engaged but separated when Stephanie couldn't handle Bundy's immature ways, crazy streaks and lack of ambition. People believe he never fully got over losing Stephanie as there is a resemblance between Stephanie and most of Bundy's victims. Similarities include long brown hair, white females, and college students between 15 to 25 year olds. Ted Bundy and future crime author Anne Rule worked together at the Suicide Prevention Hotline in Seattle during Bundy's early adult years before becoming a serial killer. At the time, he was going to college and dating Stephanie Edwards. Later, Anne Rule would become one of those among the shop people to learn about Bundy's secret life. When questioned about a days with Bundy, Rule stated that he was very skilled at his job as a volunteer and helpful towards the callers. She said he helped ease many callers and saved hundreds of lives. Many people who research Ted Bundy and the reasons behind his serial killer ways believe that one of the factors was Bundy's grandfather, Samuel Cowell. Relatives of Bundy stated that his grandfather was well known for his explosive temper and obsession with pornography. People indicate that his grandfather showed Bundy his large collection of pornography, which included violent sex acts. On top of this, 
Some people think that Samuel wasn't only Bundy's birth father, but also molested Bundy as a child. In July of 1974, two women, Janice Ott and Denise Nuzland, who attended a Lake Sammamish Park picnic, disappeared during the event. In conversations with a killer, the Ted Bundy tapes, interviewers from the cases, state that these disappearances gave them apparent details. First, they learnt that the suspect was a male who was injured as he had a cast on his arm and stated he needed help loading up his sailboat. Through the witnesses at the park, the police were able to get a sketch of the suspect. Ted Bundy grew up in Tacoma, Washington. Recently, a construction company called Extreme Contracting received the bid of remodelling Bundy's childhood home. They started work in September 2016 and immediately noticed strange events inside the house. While some workers claimed they heard door knobs jingle, others said they would listen to knocking on the door, but no one would be on the other side. In about seven months, the crew noticed at least 30 strange occurrences, including two notes written in the home, with one reading, leave, in sawdust, and the other, help me, in the dirt in the basement. While Bundy was in Florida during 1978, he went on another killing spree. One of Bundy's Florida victims was 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, who disappeared from her Lake City Junior High School on February the 9th. She went to retrieve her purse from homeroom, and no one ever saw her alive again. Prosecutor George Deckel stated they had much evidence to link Bundy to the crime, such as a witness who saw Bundy bringing Leach to a white van, her blood and fibres from a clothing in the van, and shoe tracks. One of the most prominent personality characteristics that threw everyone off who knew Ted Bundy was he could be a very helpful person. Not only did he save dozens of lives while working at the suicide prevention hotline, but he also rescued a young boy from drowning. The life-saving event occurred in 1970 when a three-year-old boy left his parents' side and fell into Seattle's Green Lake. Witnesses recall Bundy immediately jumping into the Green Lake to save the child from death. This would be around the same time when either Bundy started his serial killing spree or right before. While in college, Ted Bunny dreamed of one day becoming a lawyer. After obtaining his undergraduate degree in psychology, Bundy got accepted into law school in 1973. However, he dropped out a year later. But this did not stop Bundy from often acting as his own attorney during his Florida trial, even though he had attorneys present. Bundy asked to take part in his own defence when he stated that his lawyer believed him to be guilty. After the judge denied Bundy's lawyer's withdrawal from the case, the lawyer became advisory counsel and Bundy became the co-counsel. Bundy, who represented himself during his trial for the murder of Kimberly Leach, questioned his witness, Carol Ann Boone, about his character. She answered favourable, which is when Bundy asked Boone to marry him. She agreed. Prosecutor George Deckel believed that this announcement was one of Bundy's tricks towards the jury and asked the jury to consider the timing of the marriage proposal. Deckel felt it was Bundy's way to say that the jury couldn't convict him on his wedding day. In a documentary, Conversation with the Killer, the Ted Bundy tapes Michu stated that Ted Bundy didn't feel remorse for the killings. Bundy is recorded saying that he didn't feel any guilt and it wasn't because he closed off a part of his mind or forgot anything. Instead, he states that he has a better understanding of his actions. He further states that guilt is used to control people and it's not a healthy mechanism. Michu notes during his documentary interview that Bundy seemed to show pride. The most significant problem investigators had with Ted Bundy is his stories never matched up. When he met with one psychologist, he told him in 1969, whilst visiting a family in Pennsylvania, he killed two women. He said to another psychologist that he attempted his first kidnapping in 1969 while living in Seattle, 
but the first time he murdered a woman was in 1971. While Bundy spoke to a homicide detective, Robert D. Keppel, Bundy told him that he killed one woman in 1972 and another in 1973. However, he never talked more about these murders. Ted Bundy only gave a number to the women he raped, tortured and murdered before his execution in the electric chair. When he gave this number, he stated about 30 women. However, many believe that Bundy killed several more women. The estimated number of women and young girls murdered by Bundy is about 100. The problem is because he never told one person everything and usually left out many details, investigators couldn't find out the exact number. Plus, no one knows when Bundy started murdering people and the question will probably remain a mystery. In the documentary, The Ted Bundy Tapes, Bundy explains that Diane Edwards, his girlfriend during college, inspired him to do more with his life. Therefore, he decided to try his hand in politics. He started volunteering for the Republican Party for the state of Seattle. He joined Governor Daniel E. Evans' re-election campaign, and when Evans was re-elected, became an assistant to Ross Davis. In the documentary, Bundy states that he enjoyed politics because it allowed him to use his natural talent and assertiveness. The documentary, The Ted Bundy Tapes, discusses how Bundy worked for the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission. Bundy had access to crime statistics, especially for the section he worked on, which was crimes against women, particularly rape. He would study the information and then give them advice on how they could work to prevent rape. Through this work, Bundy noticed that police departments didn't always know what they needed to and realised someone who knew the way police worked could get away with these crimes. Ted Bundy escaped to Florida jail in 1978 and then broke into Florida State's University Chi Omega sorority house. He only spent 20 minutes in the house, but during that time, he raped and brutally murdered two women, Margaret Bowman and Lisa Levy. He also savagely beat two other women who tried to escape the house. Both these women received a broken jaw, lacerations and missing teeth. However, Bundy didn't stop there. After leaving the sorority, he walked a few blocks and then broke into another woman's house where he beat her as well. During 1984, the FBI worked to create a computer database which will help them catch serial killers through analysing patterns. To help them create a profile, FBI agents started talking to serial killers such as Bundy. In the documentary, Mishu explains that Bundy informed the FBI that law enforcement needed to change their procedures for these types of crimes because new criminals were coming forth. Bundy discovered how serial killers return to the crime scene and leave evidence to throw law enforcement off. This database helped capture many serial killers, such as Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer. John Henry Brown became one of Bundy's attorneys during the 1970s. According to Brown, he's the only person that Bundy admitted to murdering over 100 people. Brown states that Bundy told him he didn't just murder women, but men too. Bundy told Brown that his first victim was a male. Of course, this is only one man's story to many that Ted Bundy gave to several investigators, psychologists and attorneys. However, Brown, who recently wrote a book called The Devil's Defender, claims that this is relevant information because he didn't tell anyone else. One of the truths of Ted Bundy is, while he committed dozens of twisted murders, he could turn on his charismatic personality if he wanted to. He showed this part of his character throughout his life, which is why the people who knew him best were shocked about his crimes. Bundy also used his charming personality to lure his victims to come with him. He did this by acting disabled, in need of some help, or serving as an authority figure. He would bring the victims to a private location to commit his crimes. For Ted Bundy, it wasn't enough to commit the crime and dispose of the body. 
Through investigation and interviews with Bundy, people found out that he would often return to the scene of the crime. Upon return, he would reimagine the scenario, sometimes critiquing himself to see how he could perfect the offence with his next victim. Sometimes he would be aroused when imagining the crime. Bundy would occasionally return to the scene of the crime until the wild animals destroyed the location. Ted Bundy's attraction to his victims didn't end once he murdered them. If he left the corpse at the location, Bundy would return from time to time. When he did, he would become interested and continue his sexual fantasies on the carcass until decomposition made it impossible or they were torn up by wild animals. In the Netflix documentary, an FBI investigator states the body showed post-mortem mutilation on the breast. Later in the documentary, Bundy admitted to performing sexual abuse two days before his execution. Ted Bundy became an extremely violent man throughout his life. Some of his victims he brutally beat, but didn't kill. Whether Bundy thought they would die from the beating and left them for dead, or didn't care if they lived or died, is subject to speculation. However, a few of his victims he planned to kill made it out alive. In fact, one of these victims from Salt Lake City identified Bundy in the police lineup in 1975. Ted Bundy didn't just use his hands to rape and kill his victims. While people aren't sure that we even know all the weapons he used throughout his serial killer era, we do know that he used a tire iron, various knives, a gun, and other items he beat his victims. He also used any foreign object he could to sodomize his victims before and after their death. While some details about Bundy's murders came into light before cops arrested him due to the similarities of the crimes. Much information did not emerge until after his arrest and trial in Florida. One of these details was Bundy kept souvenirs from his victims. Not only did he take pictures of his victims after the crime, but also kept their body parts, such as victims' heads. When asked about this, Bundy simply stated that when you work so hard to do something correctly, you want a souvenir. Ted Bundy used all the advantages he could think of while serving as his lawyer during his late 1970s and early 1980s trial in Florida. While he acted as his attorney, the judge allowed Bundy not to be locked up in shackles during his trial. This loophole proved to be a mistake when Bundy asked if he could be excused to use the law library during a break so he could study his case. The judge allowed this, but while Bundy checked things out in the library, he found a window and escaped. After escaping from the law library, Bundy hid around the area for nearly a week before authorities captured him again. Even though Bundy fractured his ankle when he jumped from the second story of the building, he walked through Aspen, getting rid of his outer layer of clothing. Bundy then broke into a hunting cabin where he took a gun and some food. From there, he wandered around the forest. Six days later, a cop spotted a weaving car and upon pulling the vehicle over, found Bundy. Ted Bundy found a way to escape a second time, this time while living in prison. One day, Bundy noticed a one square foot wide hole in the corner of his cell ceiling. He then lost about 35 pounds and escaped on December 23rd, 1977. To make it look like he was sleeping in his bed, Bundy piled files and books under his blanket. Authorities never found him until a couple of months later, on February the 15th, 1978. During this time, we know he murdered at least two college women and brutally beat a few others. While Ted Bundy did many cruel things to his victims, biting was one of them that eventually helped put him in prison. Nearly all of Bundy's victims, that are acknowledged to be his anyway, had bite marks all over their body, including the breasts, stomach and butt. Bundy bit one of his victims so hard that he took off her nipple. To connect Bundy to his crimes, he received an impression of his teeth, which matched the bite marks of his victims. 
Anne Rule wrote about many true crime stories, and this included killers. One of her most popular books was about Ted Bundy and his life as a serial killer. Rule, who worked with Bundy at the Suicide Prevention Hotline, titled her book, The Stranger Beside Me. The story received publication in 1980 and quickly became a bestseller. In the text, Rule also discusses her reaction to Bundy's crimes, which included not believing he committed the crimes. Whether he treated murder like a sport because of his obsession, or to him, it really became a sport is unknown. What we do know is that Bundy trained for his killing sprees. He even had what we call an off-season, where he'd pick up different women and let them go to keep his skills fresh. To Bundy, killing was like basketball or cooking and required regular practice. Several criminals have a fan club once they become famous. One of the most notable of these criminals, other than Charles Manson, is Ted Bundy. Even though Boone and Bundy remained married for the beginning of his final prison stay, women swarmed around everything Bundy. They would send him letters, writing about how much they loved him and stood by him. Thousands of women around the United States called him hot and sexy. On February the 10th, 1980, the day after Ted Bundy proposed and married Carol Ann Boone while she sat on the witness stand, citing his innocence, the judge handed Ted Bundy his sentence. For the third time, the judge gave Ted Bundy death by electrocution. Both Boone and Bundy became irate and yelled, continuing to proclaim his innocence. However, nine years later, the third death sentence would go through. A year after Bundy and Boone married in court, Boone gave birth to a daughter, whom they named Rose. However, four years later, Bundy admitted to multiple murders, making Boone divorce him. Since then, the daughter changed her name and lived out of public eye. While this is Bundy's only known daughter, many people believe he fathered more children. On January 24th, 2019, the streaming service Netflix released season one of The Conversations with a Killer, The Ted Bundy Tapes. This is a documentary series which features interviews of Ted Bundy while he sat on death row. Season one features four episodes that include archival footage and present day interviews from those involved with Ted Bundy, along with audio recordings. While the series seemed to be a great hit on Netflix, it has also received its fair amount of criticism. Nonetheless, it's a great way to get inside the mind of serial killer Ted Bundy if you want to. While some people protested the execution of Ted Bundy, most people celebrated his death. The man of pure evil finally received his death sentence and by 6am in the morning of his execution, people buzzed to the fence of the Florida State Prison. That morning, at least 500 people showed up around the time Bundy got his head shaved. Some people sold t-shirts about the event while others created smoked Bundy burgers to sell. In the Netflix documentary, interviewees state that people chanted, burn Bundy burn and set off fireworks. In the Netflix documentary, Conversations with a Killer, Bundy discusses they were able to come up with 30 murders he committed within seven states, which included California, Washington, Florida, Idaho, Utah, Oregon, and Colorado, between the years of 1973 and 1978. After being asked, Bundy admitted to burying roughly 10 of these victims. Hagmire then asked Bundy around how many of these victims he beheaded, Bundy responded by guessing around 6 out of the 30. During this time, Bundy spoke about how he practiced necrophilia for the first time. On the day of his execution, Bundy talked to Hagmire about how he didn't want them to kill him and said that killing him is just society's way of getting an eye for an eye. While people partied and awaited news of his death outside, Bundy continued to pray and read his Bible. During this time, Bundy started to show remorse by crying. Witnesses to Bundy's execution state in the Netflix documentary that when Bundy walked into the death chamber, he looked white as a sheet. Ted Bundy died on January the 24th, 1989, at the age of 42.